Now, the, the state where the know-nothings had the greatest success was Massachusetts. Talk about success. In 1854, the know-nothing party, which hadn't even existed before that year, elected the governor, all eight congressmen from, from Massachusetts, and the entire state legislature, with the exception of two members. So they swept the entire electoral board in Massachusetts in 1854. Most anti-slavery people went into the Know Nothing movement. They didn't give up their anti-slavery feelings, but they felt that nativism was compatible or connected with hostility to slavery. After all, the Catholic Church was opposed to the abolitionist movement. They had opposed the free soil movement. The Catholic Church was largely opposed to the whole kind of Protestant-oriented reform impulse of this period. They, they saw the, ref, the, the perfectionism, the, the reform movements based on the idea of perfecting society, the church doctrine at this time saw as a kind of blasphemy. It denied original sin. It denied the inevitability of imperfection in society. Uh, the church, for example, was very generous in assisting the poor, but they didn't believe that you could abolish poverty. And even if you criticized slavery, they didn't believe that you should just agitate for its immediate uh, abolition. Um, so there was a tremendous hostility between these movements and the Catholic Church and many, most Catholic Irish voters. Now, since the Know Nothings for a year controlled Massachusetts politics, what they did gives us an indication of what, what these nativists were, who they were, and what they were trying to do. The legislature was an amazing group that was elected in 1854. They, they, none of them had much political experience. They were literally new people in politics. There were a large number of Protestant ministers in the legislature. Uh, the president of the Senate was a shoemaker. There were a lot of skilled workers. And um, the Massachusetts legislature of 1854 had the lowest number of lawyers of any legislature in the history of Massachusetts. And as a result of that, they actually did a lot of good things. Um, <laughs> they did adopt a nativist what was their nativist program? Well, they, they couldn't quite agree on this. The, the government under the Know Nothings be, did begin <coughs> deporting indigent Irish immigrants. It's an interesting thing that there was no national immigration policy at this time. There were no national restrictions on immigration. There were those racial descriptions, <coughs> discriminations, as I said, on becoming a citizen. But anybody could come into the United States, basically. Um, it's only later on that you begin to get these laws barring one group or another group, whether it's anarchists or people with a communicable disease or prostitutes, and on and on and on and on, people not literate. Not in this period. But states basically ran their own immigration policy, as some states are trying to do today. Um, so Massachusetts deported, it, I was just talking yesterday to a guy who was writing a book about this, very interesting, I didn't know this at all. In the period from about 1840 to 1870, Massachusetts deported 15,000 immigrants. Now deported is a funny word because they kicked them out of the state. They don't all go back to Ireland, some of them may have gone to Canada, some of them may have gone to New York, I don't know. But they were thrown out of Massachusetts because they were a public charge, they, they could not support themselves etc. And that peaks during this know-nothing period. They also, they debated about this 21-year naturalization period and eventually not, narrowed it down to a two-year proposal, a, a two-year gap between immigrating and voting, which isn't really that radical a step. But anyway, that was it. But most of their legislation had nothing to do in any direct way with immigrants. Um, they um, uh, they, they passed important anti-slavery legislation. They passed a new what we call personal liberty law to try to protect the rights of fugitive slaves who ended up in Massachusetts to say they should get a jury trial and this kind of thing. Um, they, um, they sent to the Senate Henry Wilson to the U.S. Senate, a radical anti-slavery politician. Interestingly, the Know Nothing legislature integrated, the racially integrated, the public schools of Boston, which had been racially segregated up to that point. In 1849, 
The great Charles Sumner had fought a case in the, up to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, the Roberts case, challenging the racial segregation of the Boston public school system. And Sumner's argument, anticipated by, what, 105 years, the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education of 1954. Sumner's argument was, separate can never be equal. The very act, that they said, oh, well, these schools that these blacks have are perfectly okay. Sumner made the argument, no, the, it can never, the very act of separating out one group of Americans as unfit to associate with others is in itself an act of inequality, regardless of whether the school is a good school, a bad school, a big school, a little school. Separation is inherently unequal. The Massachusetts Supreme Court rejected Sumner's argument, but the legislature of the Know Nothings in 1854, uh, 1855, re required the integration of public schools. Um, which shows the merger of anti-slavery and nativism, but it also shows, you know, at least these black people were Protestant, right? So they were, in a sense, less alien than these Irish immigrants in some ways. Um, they also did, they established a, um, a commission to investigate the nunneries in Massachusetts. See what was going on in there. <laughs> then they discovered there were no nunneries in Massachusetts. <laughs> But there were a, a, a certain number of seminaries for uh, priests or monks, I don't know. And so they investigated them. And the, the, the abbot or whatever was uh, very, generally in these places was very shrewd. And he put on, you know, these monks have some pretty good wine cellars by and large. And um, even though these fellows were interested in, in temperance, they also liked a good meal. And so they would have these very nice banquets at these monasteries or seminaries uh, with fine wine flowing, and then they basically issued a report saying, eh, there's no problem with these places. They seem to be doing a good job. <laughs> so nothing was done about the non-existent nunneries or uh, seminaries and boarding, Catholic boarding schools of Massachusetts. But the main effort was actually on, an, uh, of these, this legislature was different. It was economic reform to try to up, uplift the skilled native work, native-born workers who were being adversely affected by immigration. So, for example, they passed a, what we call a homestead exemption law, that people would not, uh, up to a certain value, you would not lose your home for debt. In this case, it was $800. In other words, up to eight, uh, you, the first $800 of your home you would not lose, which is a lot back then, and most working class people's homes were not worth $800. So you could not have that seized for debt. Um, even if you owed money to somebody. Um, they uh, repealed imprisonment for debt. They introduced the first legislation anywhere in the United States trying to regulate railroad rates, the first state intervention to set or, or limit railroad rates. They passed a temperance law, which is anti-immigrant. They um, passed a law for compulsory <laughs> vaccination, against smallpox, I guess. The Catholic Church opposed that, so that could be seen as an anti-immigrant measure. But largely, it reflected the demands of these native-born Protestant workers who felt themselves being undermined in some way by massive immigration. Um, but Massachusetts also shows an, another important aspect of nativism as a political, as a political impulse, which is it was an alternative to the rising sectional discord. It was a point on which North and South could unite in defense of America against an alien uh, uh, danger. Um, many of the people who joined the Know Nothings were conservative Whigs. The Whig Party was pretty much dead by now. They didn't want to go with the new Republican Party, which was too radical. So the Know Nothings became a kind of harbor, a safe harbor for Whigs on the thought that it would it would moderate the sectional uh, tensions, a unifying issue. That was most prominent in the South. Now, you might say, what do they need a nativist party in the South? They don't have any immigrants, by and large. But the know-nothings become quite powerful for a while in the upper South, in Maryland, where they do have a lot of immigrants, in Baltimore, in Virginia, in Kentucky. Um, uh, 
in Missouri, the Upper South, the area on the border between freedom and slavery, uh, which is always the most anxious to somehow settle the sectional uh, discord, um, the leaders were people like uh, John Crittenden, who we'll hear about in Kentucky, uh, uh, Bell of Tennessee, uh, we'll hear about them in 1860. Again, they were Whigs who would not join the Democratic Party, um, were looking for a new political home, and they were the ones, the Know Nothings, run a campaign in 1856, we'll see this next time. They nominate President, ex-president Millard Fillmore. Why? He was the guy who signed the Compromise of 1850. He's a symbol of sectional reconciliation. The Know Nothings nominate him as their candidate for president in 1856. Well, next week we'll look at that that campaign. It's a, the Know Nothing Party, in that sense, is an attempt to recreate the political center in a situation where politics is dividing uh, into irreconcilable uh, uh, factions, so to speak. So as such, of course, it didn't succeed. As a national party, the Know Nothings were destroyed by the same forces that destroyed the, that destroyed the Whig Party the slavery question. In large areas of the North, as I said, they were actually free soil, anti-slavery. In the South, they were pro-slavery, even though they were attempting to find this political middle ground. And the know-nothings were kind of ground down by the slavery issue. Whenever they had tried to have a national know-nothing convention, which they did in 1855 and again in 1856, it broke up. It broke up into northern and southern parts because they could never agree on any political statement relating to the slavery question. They could agree on defending America, on defending the Union, but when it came to the specifics of the current politics, the know-nothings could not agree north-south. Um, so the party rises and falls very, you know, uh, uh, mercurially, or whatever the word I'm looking for. Quickly, what's that? Meteoric, you're right, we need a good, they're absolutely right. Meteoric rise and meteoric fall uh, of the know-nothings. But these people don't just go away. The party disappears pretty fast. But the nativist voting base, particularly in the North, will begin to get absorbed into the Republican Party. The Republican Party, as it emerges, never has an official nativist position. If you look at their platforms in 1856, so they don't say anything negative about immigrants or Roman Catholics, quite the reverse. They say, we, we oppose discrimination against immigrants are an important voting bloc uh, in, in, in the West. In New York, they're voting Democratic, but in Illinois, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, they're a major voting bloc which the Republican Party seeks to win. So, um, but nonetheless, they're an important element in the Republican Party, and the real decline of nativism takes place in the Civil War. The Civil War kills off nativism for a while. Why? Because Germans and Irish, like black people, go and fight for the Union. And fighting for the Union, fighting for the nation, dying for the nation, kind of gives you a claim to full and equal uh, American citizenship. So that is one of the many, many ways in which the Civil War will affect the evolution of American society. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Next week we'll go back to the Republican Party and see how they emerge in this same period.